Hi, I've just reviewed the most sophisticated configuration of an AI coding tool ever, and it performed horribly in practice. I'm Jonas from Eclipse Source. Let me show you why. When we work with teams on AI coding adoption, one of the first things that we do in preparation, even before any training or workshops, is inspect their AI tool setup. We look at configuration files, MCP servers, custom commands, and so on. And perhaps surprisingly, this video will not be about the importance of such a good set setup. There are many videos out there, including on this channel, highlighting this. What I want to talk about today are three less visible issues that often prevent teams from being happy with their setups and even lead experienced team members to have their own shadow setup because the central global one just doesn't work for them. I see these patterns repeatedly and they are rarely discussed. Let's start with number one. Let me show you something. Let's look at a setup that I reviewed a couple of weeks ago. I, of course, anonymized the setup. Um, so this team was using Cloud Code and let's look at the MCP servers that they configured. We have Atlassian because that's their requirements tool, Context7, so the agent can look up documentation, file system, GitHub, uh, because that's where the code was. GitLab, because they also use GitLab. Memory one, so the agent can re recall something. And Playwright for UI, UI testing. And finally, use code, because that was the IDE that we were, that we're using. Now, some of you might immediately argue that, uh, for example, the file system server is not necessary because Cloud Code can already write. Same is probably true for memory. But I want to show you something else. Um, let me look at the context window. In Cloud Code, you can visualize that with a slash command context, and that will show me how much of the context window is already consumed even before I start to write any message. And that's pretty interesting here. We can see that the MCP service configured already consumed 27% of the context window. And we are working here with Opus 4.5, right? Now, what's the problem with this? If we now start to uh, with a coding task, and rewrite messages and prompt, and um, the, the agent will look at file, files, the context window will immediately fill up. And there is a rule of thumbs, and many say you should always stay below 40% of the context window, because above that starts the dumb zone. However, if we already consume 60%, <laughs> basically, as we can see here, um, with the tools that we configured, we don't give the model any chance or the agent any chance. We will be immediately over 40%. Even worse, if we have conflicting tools like the fi file server that conflicts with um, Cloud Code's own tools, we really confuse the agent. So what I did here is because it was not working well, I immediately removed all the MCP servers, or almost all of them, and then it started to work immediately. Now, MCP servers are one part of this, and they're very obvious because you can count them. But there is another thing. Let me show you. In the same context overview, we can spot a second less uh, obvious problem, and that's the memory files here. It's only at 3.4%, 7,000 tokens. But what's behind this is a plot, cloud and default, so a project context file of roughly 850 lines. It was very detailed. The team really spent a lot of effort in creating great documentation, coding guidelines, architectural guidelines, coding examples, and so on. But the agent was not following this consistently. And the problem is it was just too much. Um, the, the, even when adding instructions like always or very important and so on, the agent continuously ignored um, these instructions. The solution was obviously, again, to reduce the size of the project context. What lies behind these issues of context overload is actually engineering practice to integrate everything and document everything. And we learned that this is good. However, with AI, more context is not necessarily bad. The especially nasty thing about context overload is that it is hard to detect when using an agent because the result will be that it does weird things. It doesn't follow instructions. It just behaves weirdly. It's much easier, by the way, if an agent is missing context to understand why it fails in, in contrast to giving it too much information. We will discuss a strategy to solve this at the end of this video. For now, let's dive into the second issue that I frequently um, observe with setups. 
The second issue is a little bit related to the first one, but even harder to see. Over the last month, especially when I work with very experienced teams, strong engineers, um, a lot of experience with AI coding already, they often tend to create strong automation layers. Um, automatic pipelines that go from bug reports to fixing something to automatically generating tests, running them, committing the fix, updating the documentation, and finally reviewing the PR and even merging it. Everything can be automated. And this is actually how AI coding might look in the future. However, in practice, often the team was very unhappy with it and claimed that the tool just doesn't work. Now, when we looked at that more in detail, um, the expectation was often, okay, I just run the command, I just enter the bug number, and then the tool is supposed to do everything from A to Z, and I don't have to look at that again. And that's actually not a false thought because the automation makes you think that you need to do nothing, right? You just need to enter the bug number. In practice, of course, you have to watch the full process. But the problem is if the team doesn't understand the full automation because it didn't create it and it doesn't know exactly what happened in which step and how to influence which step, it's not possible for the team to first understand that they still need to think about what they do. They need to review every step. They need to review, for example, the original bug report. And second, they just don't know how to treat every step, how to influence the prompt and what to do if something fails. So what happened here is actually a pattern. We are computer scientists and we love automation. And for deterministic systems, this is actually great because once we have automated something, we don't have to worry about it anymore and nobody has to understand it except some people that can actually maintain the automation. For AI systems, as they are indeterministic, this doesn't work the same way. If we don't allow the team that is supposed to use the automation to develop a feeling and intuition how to work with AI beforehand, we don't give them a chance to be able to understand why something fails. So what we did in practice or what we do in practice when this occurs, we remove almost all the automation um, and let the team work manually with prompts again until they develop a good understanding what the AI can do and what it can't do, and then slowly build up the automation again. This works much better in our experience. Let's get to issue number three. Now, the third issue that we frequently observe is an organizational one. AI tool setups are often created by lead architects, by experienced team members, or even by central infrastructure teams. And we often observe that these people spend a lot of effort, investigation to create really, really good setups. And even if they avoid the issues that we discussed in this video so far, we also often observe that they are not well received by the teams. Um, and we, in particular, observe three symptoms. Number one, the team claims it doesn't work well and they refuse to use it. Number two, um, experienced team members create their own setups and keep it from themselves. And number three, um, these setups stale. So they're initially created, but they never change. So you can actually check if you look at your setups files in your Git repository, and they never change for a long time, one month, three months. There's definitely something wrong because these files need to continuously evolve over time, especially project context file files, new information must be added. Otherwise there is something wrong. You never can create these configuration files perfectly in the beginning. Now, what's the problem here? Even if the setups are good, if the team just gets these configuration files and the, the whole setup thrown over a fence, they cannot develop ownership for it. They have no motivation to tweak these files. They don't understand exactly why they were created the way they are. Um, and they're just a black box for them. And that's actually bad. So to work efficiently in practice, I strongly recommend to create the initial setup together with the team, inform them about all decisions. Of course, there needs to be a central responsible person for that or a team, but you need to get your team on board why the configuration is uh, as, as it is. And, and how the project context files were created. Only then the team is able to create ownership of them, uh, report any issues and tweak and augment and adapt the configuration so it works perfectly in practice. I think it's not possible to only do this central. So now that we discussed three issues, what actually works in our experience? 
Instead of trying to get the setup perfect on day one, treat it as something that will evolve. Create an iter iterative process that will continuously improve your setup over time. Start minimal. Let people feel the friction that something is missing, because only if people feel that something is missing, they will understand the value of adding something more to your configuration, some automation, some additional information, and so on. And when you add something, discuss it with the team. Let people disagree. A slight worse setup that everybody agrees on and that everybody understands will always be a better setup that nobody wants and that nobody understands. With this strategy, you will achieve three things. First, a common understanding, not siloed expertise. Everybody will understand why the setup works and what it does. Second, a grounded intuition. Because you allowed friction before automation, the team will understand the purpose of the automation as they did it manually beforehand. And finally, you will cr create automation that fits your team because the team did these things manually and they decided what they want to automate and what not. In contrast to just automating everything based on theoretical uh, assumptions on day one. Now, this approach might feel slower in the beginning but I guarantee you it's not. It's the only approach that I observed in practice that works and scales well. In this video, we discussed three issues that actually have one underlying pattern. And that is treating AI as a problem that we want to automate rather than a practice that we want to develop and learn together. If you work through these or similar issues with your team, we offer training and consulting specifically focused on AI coding adoptions. Helping teams to get through these and many other issues is what we do. In the description of this video, you'll find a link to our training and consulting offer. Finally, if you like this video, we will soon publish more videos on invisible blockers for AI coding in other areas. So please leave a like on this video and consider to subscribe to our channel. And thank you for watching.